Shall we get started? Um, I might need extra time today, so I shouldn't waste any minutes here. We, I don't want to go over, so let's just get straight to it. We're showing that the Hilbert transform implies UMD. That's what we started showing on Tuesday by reducing the UMD property down to this dyadic UMD property, which is UMD, but restricted to the dyadic filtration on the unit interval. And this proof that Christoph was confused about on Tuesday, the reason he was confused is that the proof's wrong. <laughs> That's um, my construction of the filtration was actually wrong. You need to work a little bit harder in constructing that filtration to get the conditional expectation property that we needed. So forget, okay, don't forget completely the proof from Tuesday because the idea is right. You just need to work a bit harder in the last step. And certainly don't forget the result. I mean, the result is true. My proof was just a little bit off. UMD is equivalent to dyadic UMD. So when you're proving the UMD property, you only have to consider martingales on the dyadic filtration. You don't have to look at all of the possible filtrations and martingales. It makes your life a bit easier. And yeah, so we're going to deduce that from the boundedness of the Hilbert transform. And remember our Hilbert transform, at least the scalar valued version of that is an operator on, on LP on the real line, P between minus infinity. And what we're going to need is actually the Hilbert transform on the torus rather than the real line. So we need to modify this a bit. The torus, if you're used to um, mathematicians calling things by stupid names, the torus is the circle. <laughs> it's a group, it's the real line modulo the integers. So it's the unit interval zero one with addition modulo one, right? So you only take the fractional part of the addition. The reason we call this the the torus rather than the circle is because we also look at higher dimensional versions. So for all natural numbers n, the, the n torus is t to the n, which is the, the product of the torus with itself n times. So it's circle you know, times itself n times, that's the torus if you're used to geometry. Or you can think of this as rn modulo integers to the n. And you can think of that as the unit interval to the power n, if you like, addition modulo well, not modulo one, but modulo z to the n. Right, and a reason this is clearly important to us is these are probability spaces. If you put the product Lebesgue measure on the unit interval on this space, these all have measure one. So let's define the Fourier transform on the torus or the n-dimensional tori because we're going to need that. Uh, I think I defined that at one point in the class way back, but let's just quickly do it again. If you have an integrable function valued in a Banach space on the, the n torus for any n, the Fourier transform maps the integers z to the n to x. And the Fourier coefficients are defined in the usual way. Integrate the function over the torus against a complex exponential, e to the two pi i. Usually we would have t times n, but now t and n are n-dimensional vectors, right? So we take the dot product instead, t dot n. This is for all n in z to the n. So let's just write, to be clear, n is a, a tuple of integers. So these are Fourier coefficients of a function on the torus. This is all very standard if you know Fourier analysis. Uh, we say that F is a trigonometric polynomial I mean, you probably have some idea of what a trigonometric polynomial is. The precise definition here is that F is a trigonometric polynomial if its Fourier transform has finite support. So you've only got finitely many non-zero Fourier coefficients and that implies that F can actually be written as a sum. I write the sum over all z to the n, but only finitely many of these terms are going to be non-zero. It's a combination of complex exponentials and Fourier coefficients, like that. So you have finite support here, because only finitely many of those Fourier coefficients are non-zero by assumption when f is a trigonometric polynomial. This is like a Fourier inversion formula. And in, in general, you don't have this point-wise in such a nice way, but for trigonometric polynomials, you have this for all t in the n torus. 
there's no issues of convergence because the sum's finite. So that's what a trigonometric polynomial is. And the last thing we need to say about this is that trigonometric polynomials, trig polys, because we're going to be writing it repeatedly, let's not write the full word out each time. Trigonometric polynomials are dense in LP. P to the n valued in x. Uh, for all p between 1 and infinity, let's not include infinity. And for all Banach spaces x, no assumptions are needed on that. This is because in the scalar valued case, you have this density and you do the same argument we always make with uh, algebraic tensor products. There's no issues there. So that's everything we need to know about trigonometric polynomials. Is that clear? It's a little bit quick, but I figure we've seen this before. And frankly, I need the time to do this argument we need to do. So let's move on from there. So we have the language of trigonometric polynomials and we're gonna use that to define the, the Hilbert transform on the, the torus, the one torus, not the n torus. We just have it on the one dimensional torus. So let's take X to be a complex Banach space. Oh, I should have said that X needs to be a complex Banach space throughout all of this because we're multiplying by complex numbers here. This won't make sense if we don't take a complex Banach space. Let's just say X is complex. To be short, right, x is a complex Banach space. And let's take an integrable function on the torus, the, the one torus, which is a trigonometric polynomial. Then we define the Hilbert transform of this function. We write it as h sub t to emphasize this is the Hilbert transform on the torus rather than on the real line. Uh, we basically take the Fourier multiplier representation of the Hilbert transform and we apply it to these Fourier series. So E sub N, I should have given that a name earlier. This complex exponential will denote by E sub N of T, complex exponential with frequency N. So we write out the Hilbert transform like this. So you see that this is a Fourier multiplier, but on the torus now, its symbol, which is a function on the integers is minus I times the, the signum function of the frequency, just as in the case of the, the Hilbert transform on the line. And because F is a trigonometric polynomial, the sum's finite. And so everything is well-defined. It's well-defined, it's a finite sum because of the trigonometric polynomial assumption. So the natural question is, okay, this is defined on all trigonometric polynomials. Can we define it on all LP functions? Do we have LP boundedness of this operator? Can we extend it by density of the trigonometric polynomials to all of LP? You'd expect that you should have this LP boundedness when the Hilbert transform on the real line is bounded. And that's exactly right. This is an equivalent thing. I have the proof of this in the notes and to save time, I'm not gonna do it live. It would take about half an hour. It is, it's a nice proof, but we simply don't have time for it. So read this in the notes. Proofs in the notes. Let's take P between one and infinity, not including one, or it's not true. And X to be a complex Banach space, uh, such that the Hilbert transform on the real line has a bounded X valued extension. For example, we know that this is true when X is UMD. We're showing the converse, so we're not gonna assume X is UMD. We're gonna just assume that the Hilbert transform has a bounded X valued extension. Then you have LP boundedness of the Hilbert transform on the torus. So you have this estimate here for all trigonometric polynomials F. And I'll say F in LP, but actually all trigonometric polynomials are automatically in LP. They're finite sums of complex exponentials. These are bounded functions. Of course, the whole thing's in LP. Uh, so I've said here that boundedness of the Hilbert transform on the real line in 
pliers bound on the Zillow, but transform on the torus. The converse is also true. I haven't written the proof of that in the notes, but these are equivalent properties, it turns out. And actually, yeah, we're going to show that this boundedness of the Hilbert transform on the torus actually implies that X is UMD. So that will then imply that the Hilbert transform on the real line is bounded because we've already proven that. That's a very indirect proof of this equivalence. You can prove that more directly. Now, just one little note before I forget. Uh, once we know that the Hilbert transform is bounded on LP, it actually implies that the, let's give this a little name, HT tilde, the Hilbert transform with coefficients in LP of the N torus is also bounded. Let's just say it's bounded from here to itself. This is a little bit confusing. This is the Hilbert transform with X valued coefficients. And this is the Hilbert transform with LP X valued coefficients on the N torus for every N. What this is saying is once you know that X has this property that the Hilbert transform is bounded, you know that LP of X also has that property. Actually for every measure space, not just the N torus. And this is a basic Fabini argument Uh, using that LP of T, the torus valued in LP of TN, valued in X, is actually the same thing as LP of the N torus valued in LP of T, the one torus, Fabini just lets you put, because that these exponents P are the same. You can swap the order of integration and you can say, you can consider it as a function on the torus or you can consider it as a function on the N torus. And when you consider it in that second way as a function on the N torus, you end up just seeing the, the Hilbert transform on the torus on the inside, and you can use the bounds that you've assumed. Again, the arguments in the notes, I won't write that out here, but we'll use that later on. Is that not too unclear? I do feel I'm going a bit quick. I'll slow down slightly. If we run out of time, we'll just spend more time next week. So, okay, so we know that the Hilbert transform on the torus is bounded once you have boundedness on the real line. And you can build some similar operators out of that, some auxiliary operators that we're going to need later on. Let's take X to be a complex Banach space such that the Hilbert transform on the torus is bounded on LP. This is going to be our fundamental assumption throughout everything we do today. So for, we should fix an integer, fix an integer capital N. And for small n less than or equal to capital N, we will let T sub N be the nth copy of the torus T in the N torus. <laughs> so what I mean by that is we write the N torus as a product T sub one times T sub two up to T sub N. This terminology will be useful for us because we're gonna to need to consider functions on the N torus and we're gonna to need to consider how they act in each variable separately. So it's just good to give these individual factors names. And we're going to let H sub T N, so this is like a Hilbert transform on the torus, but in the nth variable, be the operator on LP of the N torus, which acts as the, the torus Hilbert transform on the nth factor, so in the nth variable. So just to write that out, sort of rigorously. If we have a function f on the n torus, we have n variables to work with. This is given by taking the function f and fixing all of the variables except for the nth one. So now this is a function just of the, that's not n, that's t sub n. 
this here is a function of the nth variable, p sub n, for each choice of all of the other variables. You take that function, you apply the torus Hilbert transform to it, because it's a single variable function, and then you evaluate that at t sub n. This is the Hilbert transform acting purely in the nth variable, ignoring all the other variables. And by the assumptions, by the assumption that the Hilbert transform is bounded on LP, the torus Hilbert transform, you get that this H sub Tn is, is bounded on LP of the N torus. Just by Fabini, all of the action is happening in the nth variable. You use the bound there, integrate out, everything works out okay. So we're gonna need these operators in this argument. And one last little note, If you have LP of the N torus, you can freely identify that with LP of the torus valued in LP of the N minus one torus. The Fabini argument we said before. You can consider it as, a, as an N variable function or a one variable function valued in N minus one variable functions. I hope this all makes sense. This argument that the that the Hilbert transform boundedness implies UMD uses all of the interplay between the different variables on the end torus and it gets very subtle. So we need this, these identifications and this terminology of T sub N for the nth copy of the torus and the nth torus and so on. It's confusing, but we need all of this stuff. I think now we can get to the point of actually doing the argument. Oh, hang on, I've got one more definition to make, sorry. Uh, for every Barnack space Y, I say Y because we're going to have an X lying around and the Y that we take is not going to be X. For every Barnack space Y and for P greater than one, we define a space LP zero of the N torus valued in Y. And this is just the functions in LP valued in Y, which have integral zero. Simple. These mean zero functions are going to come up constantly in this argument. Okay, now we can do some math. Now we've made enough definitions and preliminary stuff. Are there questions for that? If anything doesn't really make sense, I think it might make a bit more sense as we go on, but or not. <laughs> or it could just be difficult the whole way through. So this argument that boundedness of the Hilbert transform implies the UMD properties by Borgan in, I think, 1985. And it is a, an incredibly difficult and subtle argument that I can't believe anybody would come up with. Uh, I'm not convinced that Borgan was human. He was just too good at this stuff. He had like over 800 papers or something like that. It's absolutely ridiculous. He's, yeah, probably the best analyst of for the modern age of analysis. I don't know, it's ridiculous. Anyway, the argument relies on this fundamental proposition, which I will call the fundamental proposition. There's a fundamental proposition and a fundamental lemma, and these come together to, to prove the thing. So the fundamental proposition, if X is such that the Hilbert transform on the torus is bounded on LP, X is a complex finite space, of course. Uh, P is between one and infinity. We take P greater than one. I don't think we need it less than, well, we're not gonna use P equal one, certainly. Here's the fundamental proposition. For all sequences of signs, psi sub N, so psi sub N, sub N is either plus or minus one. And for all functions, Fn that are LP with mean zero on the, the torus, but the nth copy of the torus in T to the n, right? Valued in LP of the n minus one torus. Just 
think exactly what that means. It's a function of one variable. It's got mean zero as a function of that variable, but it's valued in functions of n minus one more variables. Yeah. So this is for one less than n, less than capital N. Uh, we identify this as a subspace of LP of the N torus. So these functions here are basically functions of the first N, the first small N variables on the capital N torus. So the remaining variables don't matter, basically. So all sequences of functions like that. We have an estimate like this. So this is the, the Hilbert transform acting in the nth variable on this function f sub n. Everything's in LP of the capital N torus. We have that this is bounded by the sum of the functions f sub n. So all of these functions we're dealing with are actually functions on the capital N torus, but the nth function only depends on the first n variables. I'm sorry that I have two n's lying around, small n and capital N. I maybe should have used different letters. I'll say capital N from now on to mean the capital one. And if I just say n, I probably mean the small one, but I will get this wrong probably more than half the time. I'll try to clarify what I mean by that. This, this capital N was a bad choice, but it's too late now. All of these are functions on the capital N torus. F sub N depends on the first N variables and it's mean zero in the nth variable. Right. And we apply the Hilbert transform to the nth function in the nth variable. It's subtle, like I said, this is book and type math. So we won't prove the fundamental proposition yet. I'll prove the boundedness of the Hilbert transform implies UMD, assuming the fundamental proposition. And that should probably take us to the break. And then after the break, we'll prove the fundamental proposition from the fundamental lemma. So we need to show that X has the dyadic UMDP property. Because from what we've tried to show on Tuesday, dyadic UMDP implies UMDP. So what I mean by that is that for all martingales F and the dyadic filtration of the unit interval for all sequences of signs, for all capital N, we have this estimate unconditionality of the different sequence of F. Uh, bounded by the sum of the differences. This is what we need to show. And you can see that there's already some relation with this fundamental proposition. We have a capital N lying around. We have a sequence of functions. We have some signs. These are all going to be basically the same. But there's a little trick here, which is something I didn't say on Tuesday. Uh, before that little trick, without loss of generality, we assume f sub 0 is 0. We can always do that, subtract off the, the f 0 part, deal with it later. It's not going to cause any issues. That's why there's no n equals 0 term. Right, uh, there's a computation you can do on the dyadic filtration. I'll do it at the end of the lecture if we have time, uh, which says that if you take the sequence of Rademacher functions, R1 to Rn, so R, the Rademacher functions, I'll say the Rademacher functions here. These aren't just any Rademacher variables, but they're the, the Rademacher functions on the unit interval defined by R sub K of T is the, signum of sine of 2 to the n pi t. So these are the square wavy sort of functions on the unit interval. If you take the Rademacher functions, then there exist functions phi sub n mapping sequences of signs, sequences of n minus 1 signs into the Banach space x, such that you can write the different sequence of fn of t, let's say, as the nth Rademacher function times phi sub n 
of the first n minus one Rutter marker functions for all n greater than or equal to one for all t in the unit interval. This is a bit surprising when you first see it. This is a characterization of, of dyadic martingales, actually. And we'll do it at the end of the lecture, as I said, if we have the time. Basically, any dyadic martingale can actually be written in terms of a function of the first n minus one Rademacher functions times the nth Rademacher function. It's believable when you think about it hard enough. When you do the proof, it's pretty convincing. Right. So we need to show, actually, that for all such functions phi, just writing out what this different sequence above is. So phi sub n, r1 up to i n minus one in LP has to be bounded by the sum without the signs in LP. I better write that this is LP of the unit interval because that is important. for all functions phi sub n, mapping sequences of n minus one signs into x. Does that make sense? Uh, these n minus one Rademacher functions, they're all valued in plus or minus one. So you have a function of the possible sequences of signs that can occur, mapping a sequence of plus minus ones into a vector x. Uh, yeah, so the definitions make sense, certainly. And now here's the first uh, nice trick, not the most subtle of the tricks, but the first nice trick. This is a representation theorem that uses concrete Rademacher functions on the unit interval, the Rademacher functions. But you know that when you have something involving Rademacher sequences, you can freely change the Rademacher sequence to a different one. And any norm estimates involving the Rademacher sequences will be the same, whichever Rademacher sequence you take. So we're going to take this concrete Rademacher sequence and replace it with a different one. Fix a Rademacher variable, doesn't matter which one. You only need one epsilon on the torus. There's an obvious choice you can take like the first Rademacher function. The torus is the unit interval basically, but it doesn't matter what the Rademacher variable is. It just needs to have probability one half that it's one and probability one half that it's minus one. We define a Rademacher sequence on the n torus. A finite Rademacher sequence. We don't have infinitely many. Epsilon sub n of t, where t is in the n torus, is epsilon of the nth component of t. So you've got your n torus, which has n copies of the torus. I should be saying capital N. The capital N torus. <laughs> has capital N copies of the torus, and you put a copy of this Rademacher variable epsilon in each of the coefficients independently. This gives you an independent sequence of random variables, so it's a, a finite Rademacher sequence. The sequence epsilon one up to epsilon and capital N is a Rademacher sequence, a finite Rademacher sequence on the capital N torus. So what we need to show, taking this estimate up here and replacing the Rademacher sequence with this new Rademacher sequence, is that this estimate holds. So now all of the R's get replaced with epsilons. But now we're on LP of the N torus, capital N torus, rather than the unit interval. So we've done a change of probability space here. The reason this is useful is that now we have sequences of functions on the capital N torus that the nth one only depends on the first n variables and it's actually mean zero in the nth variable. And this is what the fundamental proposition tells us stuff about. So the functions, uh, so epsilon n, phi n, epsilon one up to epsilon n minus one these are all in the space LP with mean zero of the nth variable valued in LP 
of the first n minus one variables valued in x for all n from one up to capital N. You can see the mean zero property by using the independence of the Rademacher variables. This epsilon sub n has got mean zero. And when you integrate this, that term will come out by the independence and will kill the integral of the remaining stuff. So what we need to show, or what it suffices to show, is that if you take this estimate with arbitrary functions g sub n, uh, this needs to be bounded by the sum of g sub n. Oops, capital N. For all functions g n, in LP zero of the nth variable, LP of the first n minus one variables. Because these functions we got out of the dyadic martingale have this form. So we have to just prove this estimate for all such functions. And now we're at something which is closer to the, the fundamental proposition. If you remember what that was, it looks like this. So it looks like what we need, but it's got some Hilbert transforms sitting in there because we don't have any Hilbert transforms appearing in this estimate. Now, what do I need to write here? So we assumed that the Hilbert transform on the real line has a bounded X valued extension. That was our assumption. So from the proposition that I stated, but didn't prove the Hilbert transform on the torus is bounded on LP of the torus. Actually, we could take, we could have just assumed this. We don't actually need the full power of the Hilbert transform in the line. It would suffice to just assume that the Hilbert transform on the torus is bounded on LP. We're going to use that next week. But for now, don't think too hard about that. And therefore, these Hilbert transforms just acting in the nth variable, these are also bounded. These are bounded on LP of T to the capital N for all N. Yep. Furthermore, just by looking at the Fourier multiplier representation, remember the nth frequency gets mapped to minus I times the, the sine, the signum of, of N, unless N equals zero, the zero frequency gets killed. So what this tells you is that the Hilbert transform acting on the nth variable squared is minus the identity operator because you have the minus i that comes up on LP of mean zero functions of the nth variable. Uh, yep, like that. The only obstruction to it being minus the identity is that the zero frequency drops out but if your function has mean zero in the nth variable, there is no zeroth frequency component. So this lets us prove what we want to prove. Starting with this guy up here, we want to estimate. We apply the identity operator to each of these functions <laughs> and we write this as the sum of xi n times the Hilbert transform in the nth variable of the Hilbert transform in the nth variable of GN, we get a minus one that drops out because that minus one doesn't affect the norm. And then we use the, the fundamental proposition twice. So the first time, yeah, the signs vanish and the first Hilbert transform vanishes. So you just get the Hilbert transform in the nth variable of G sub N. This should be capital N here. And then we use the fundamental proposition again to remove that second Hilbert transform. And that was what we needed to show. Magic. So all of these reductions from the UMD property to the dyadic UMD property saying, okay, dyadic martingales are just these things involving Rademacher functions. And then you can change, change those Rademacher functions to a certain model on the end torus then you can say, okay, well, it suffices to have this particular estimate for, 
functions on the nth torus that are mean zero in the nth, sorry, I should be saying capital N, mean zero in the small nth variable, whatever, all of that stuff, and then just reduce it down and down and down. Eventually, you just need to prove the fundamental proposition up here. which is an estimate that has nothing to do with martingales and everything to do with the Hilbert transform. So it starts to be believable that boundedness of the Hilbert transform will imply the UMD property. This is the part of the argument where you kind of somehow represent your martingales as the Hilbert transform acting on functions in a mysterious way. It's really quite subtle. I recommend going study this proof after I've told you the proof. You have to read this proof at least five times for it to make sense. It's still only just starting to make sense to me. Um, right. Are there questions? I'm surprised that there aren't questions actually. There should be some questions by now. Maybe it's all just too mysterious. <laughs> So how do we go about proving this fundamental proposition? What do we know? We know that these operators are bounded. This operator of the Hilbert transform on the torus acting in the nth variable. But we need to prove a kind of unconditionality estimate for them in this way. For any, yeah, any sequence of signs here, this is the real difficult part. Let me just see how much stuff do we need to do in the next half? What I'll do before the break is I'll prove that this uh, little result here, saying that if you have a dyadic martingale, then you can actually represent it in terms of Radomacher functions, because I think that's important and we should probably do that now. I think we have the time to do it. Just the proposition. If F is an X valued martingale. X is a binary space, it doesn't matter which. On the dyadic filtration, which we call F on the unit interval. Then there exist functions phi sub N on sequences of n minus one signs, such that the nth difference of f is the Radomacher function Rn times the function phi n of the first n minus one Radomacher functions for all n greater than or equal to one. By the way, if n equals one, uh, phi sub one maps the the empty set into X, is that right? That maps a single, uh, whatever. Phi sub one's a constant. <laughs> it doesn't depend on anything, it's just a constant. It's a function of nothing. Is that right? A function of zero variables is just a constant. Is that the right way to think about this? It's, yeah. Yes, so because it's on the empty product, right? Yeah, the empty product, and what's the empty product there? A set with? Is it the empty set or is it a set with one element? The set with the empty word. Oh, the empty word. Yeah, okay. The empty product is a set containing the empty word, which is, so it's a set with one element. <laughs> All right. It's not the empty set though. That's important. Yeah. Anyway, phi one is a constant. That's not so important. I just thought I'd make that clear. Or possibly make that less clear by bringing it up. So the proof is that we take this nth difference and we write it as the sum over all dyadic intervals of scale n minus one of the nth difference times the sum of characteristic functions. So the, the left half of the interval or the right half of the interval, however you think it, the, the two halves of the interval i. So f fn is a function of, uh, it's fn measurable. So it's constant on dyadic intervals of scale n. So if we take an interval of scale n minus one, which is bigger, we have two subintervals of scale n and it's constant on each of those halves, All right? So dfn is fn measurable. 
and therefore it's constant on the halves i plus and i minus. Let's call x sub i. Let's let that be the value of dfn on i plus. And we use, we use the fact that the expectation on fn minus one of dfn is zero <coughs> because f's a martingale. This tells you that the average of dfn on every one of these intervals on sc of scale n minus one has to be zero. So what you get is that dfn is actually constant equal to minus xi on i minus. So the value on the one half of the interval has to be the negative of the value on the other half of the interval so that they can sum to zero. So what this says is that the nth difference is equal to the sum over dn minus one of the characteristic function of one half minus the characteristic function of the other half times xi. Uh, I should have a tensor product here because I'm multiplying functions by vectors. And so what this is, is actually the nth Rademacher function, which is given by plus minus one on the various halves of the intervals. It's a square wave, right? That's what that does. It's a Rademacher function times a function phi tilde, where phi tilde is defined to be the sum over dyadic intervals of scale n minus one of the characteristic function of that interval tensor with the vector xi. Now this function phi tilde maps the unit interval to x. It's fn minus one measurable because it's constant on dyadic intervals of scale n minus one. So, and you can show that fn minus one, the sigma algebra of the dyadic, generated by the dyadic intervals of scale n minus one is actually the sigma algebra generated by the first n minus one Rademacher functions. Uh, if you're used to dealing with Rademacher functions, this is obvious. If you're not, uh, dyadic intervals of scale n minus one can be determined by taking the first unit interval and then taking either the left or the right half. So taking you index n by plus or minus one, and then you take either the left or right half of that interval you chose. So you take another plus or minus one, you make n minus one choices. And you see that what you've done is you've chosen n minus one signs. And what these n minus one signs correspond to are the values of the first n minus one Rademacher functions. Have a good think about that. You see that it's true. You can do a counting argument. Both of these sigma algebras are generated by two to the n minus one atoms. <laughs> and you see that they have to be the same. Uh, yep. So since we have an fn minus one measurable function, it's measurable with respect to the sigma algebra generated by these n minus one functions. So you see that phi tilde has to actually be equal to a function phi of the first n minus one Rademacher functions for some phi mapping the range of the Rademacher functions into x. That's how the proof works. A bit confusing when you first see it, but once you're used to dealing with Rademacher functions and how they interact with dyadic intervals, you see, yeah, this makes sense. It's just the values of the Rademacher functions actually index the dyadic intervals. Okay, any questions before the break? <laughs>